Hello, gamers. Are we almost ready to get started? My ceiling collapsed. <laughs> anyway, I'm so tired. How's everybody doing? Well, I hope. Hope we're doing well. I have nothing to drink. I should get a water. Yeah, I mean, not the whole ceiling, but, you know, a big part of it. <sighs> Just one of those things. Sogers indeed. Anyway, this is all to say. We're supposed to come by and repair it. It's still quite wet. I don't really expect them to, but you know what? Here we are. Tater Todd is still trapped in a bag. It's not super safe to be in my apartment. I haven't been here all weekend. But, somebody's gotta be here to let the guy in. Figured I'd do a stream. At this point. Good job. Hello! Hello, it's me, Abby. Welcome. I'm still in my parka because it's fucking cold in LA. There's a huge hole in my ceiling, so it's cold in my apartment, too. Um, I'm gonna show y'all Tater, who's really trying to escape this bag right now. Actually, no, I won't, because my phone number is all over this bag. Sorry! Good thing I realized before I picked it up in front of the camera! Free Tater! No. We can't trust Tater to be free. Y'all wanna see? I mean, I can zoom out of my camera. Let's see if y'all can see how. Oh, uh, no, I'm too zoomed in. Here, I think this will probably show it. Ready? Look at that. Everything's covered in plastic. This is my couch, which should be way over that this way, but it's not. It's right here. Then there's a bunch of stuff on my bed because I had to get it off the floor and out from under the hole. I love LA! <laughs> anyway, puh, puh, puh. Got hair all over my mouth. Um, Tater, I know you're so unhappy in your bag, but you're safe in your bag. <sighs> like Grandma's house, exactly. I got a bunch of shower curtains. My building's being super annoying, and they were pretty much unresponsive all weekend, which is the lovely thing. When there's a huge hole in your ceiling, let me see if I can show the damages. I got pictures. I got pics. Anyway, I'm waiting for the repair people to come. Oh, did you hear Tater meowing? I don't know. Here's just a picture of the hole. That is what my house looks like. And then here is a picture of... It's, I don't know if this will really show so well. A bunch of shit all over my floor. This is where my television and whatnot was. Thankfully, I moved it. But there's just shit everywhere. It's mostly cleaned up, sort of, but still a big hole. Still a big hole that's leaking water. Anyway, what happened was there was a leak in my ceiling, which I reported a number of times. And they have fixed it a number of times. And yet, my ceiling collapsed. So, waiting for them to fix it again and make my apartment livable. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, they need to... I don't want to have to move. That's deeply expensive. They need to reimburse me for my time away. People know any lawyers? Uh, like, I know, buddy. I don't know. Landlord lawyers? I don't remember the word they use for them. Anyway, I'm very tired. I'm so tired, I gotta say. Tater Todd, I know you don't like your little bag. And I know you're in cat prison. But you're gonna have to deal with it. This place ain't safe. And they're going to start coming and repairing, and you're going to hide under the bed, and it's going to be very hard to get you back in that bag. But my friend and neighbor Bryant will text us when you can go live with him for a little while, buddy. Keep saying Taylor's going to go on a bachelor weekend with my buddy Bryant. A couple of dudes living together doing dude stuff, you know. Yeah, landlord-tenant law. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I want. That's what I want. Anyway just a big old hole it's true a nice big wet hole there was a movie i watched in film school having a real memory of it come back to me you wonder why of uh, it's like i think it was somewhere in china maybe it was taiwan it might have been a taiwanese film um about this guy who lived in an apartment that was leaking and then there was like a woman too who's like below him there's like a hole in it. i think the movie was like called hole or something and then the leak just kept getting bigger, and the hole just kept getting bigger, and it was just getting wetter and wetter. Um, anyway, 
It was a documentary, apparently, about my life. Oh, yeah. The septum, I did... The septum is kind of new. I had my septum pierced, like, a decade ago. And then I was like, I'm kind of interested in getting the piercing back in. So I impulsively walked into a tattoo shop and was like, can you put another one in? And they were like, uh-huh. And now it's it. I'm trying not to touch it. I'm not good at that, but I'm trying not to touch it. Because it gets all scabby and weird. You know what I mean? But anyway, what do we think? I know I'm not looking my best, because I'm a little bit displaced from my home at the moment. <laughs> I know it's so fun to play with. Oh my god, you saw a TikTok from a landlord trying to convince people to tip their landlords? Landlords are cursed. I'm sorry, but landlords are cursed. If you own a huge building, you are cursed and you do not take care of your tenants. I have never had a landlord take care of my shit on time. Right, Tater Tot? You know this. This is not the first time I've had a fucking ceiling collapse in my apartment after complaining about a leak again and again and again. Ugh. Anyway, we're waiting for a knock on the door sometime between 11 and 3 p.m. Fingies crossed for us. Fingies crossed. If you own multiple properties, I think you're a bad person. I agree. I agree with that. <sighs> I've seen it going around, especially around Christmas time. That is psychic. Why am I wearing a jacket? Because it's cold in my apartment and there's a huge hole in my ceiling. I'm waiting for repair people to come. I'll say this a billion times. My home is in a state of disrepair. I'm not sleeping here. I'm not staying here. Tater Tot's in a bag on the floor right now. Because I have to get him ready. I had to be here because my super wasn't here. Oh, it was a whole to-do. Anyway. Yes, I will definitely withhold my rent until this is fixed and this place is livable. They also... I mean, I have renter's insurance. They also need to reimburse me for any damages they need to reimburse me for lost wages i've now not been able to stream multiple times they need to reimburse me like i'm fortunate that i had somewhere i was able to stay but i have a cat it's not easy to find a place to stay and like otherwise i would have been up in a hotel and they would have had to reimburse me for hotel costs like they are lucky i had a place to stay they're lucky the ceiling didn't fall on me like i have plenty of fucking lawsuits like i can get a lawyer to send a fucking letter and be like, you need to do this shit. I just don't know about lawyer. I've never worked with a lawyer. I don't know if that's going to be $500 billion and then it's just going to be like, and then nothing's going to happen. You know what I mean? But that's why I haven't dealt with a lawyer. Also, I'm running on very little sleep at the moment. A lot of stressful stuff happening. It's a great tenants unit in LA. That's good to know. Good to know. There may be some that only take fees if I win. Okay. Like finding a good mechanic. Anyway, that's all to say... I have been, like, trying to deal with the legal and law side of things sort of once. I mean, obviously, if it takes them forever to get this fixed, that'll be a different issue. But I need to be in a better headspace. I'm very tired. I've got a lot going on on top of just dealing with this. My dad's coming into town today. <laughs> I've got stuff going on tomorrow. Just a heads up, I won't be streaming tomorrow because I may or may not be doing a little something with another website. I don't know if it's live or not, but it is during the time I stream. So, and then on Wednesday, I have an interview, so I won't be streaming then either. Thursday, we'll see. Maybe I'll, it'll be livable. Oh, thank you for the gift sub. I appreciate it. I'm checking my calendar. I'm not just checking my, checking my texts. The Thursday, I do have a dental appointment at 3 p.m., but we'll see if I can stream beforehand we'll see if my home is available and hopefully friday too we'll see i don't know i don't know but yeah i'll try to let you know on the discord Oops, bug flying around tater please stop Ugh, ouch it makes sense there's a bug flying around considering my home is in terrible shape thank you good luck with the interview i'm gonna try feel good about it it's round three it always feels good but i don't know if y'all have interview tips i feel pretty pretty good Mine is be honest and be myself. Because if they don't like that, then we're probably not going to get along so well working together. And I know that I am qualified and capable. So what more can I do? You know what I mean? And then ask questions at the end. Always got to ask questions in an interview. Got to be interested. Also, I clap my hands and I'm wearing a ring and it is going to bruise. <laughs> <sighs>
bring cupcakes. Well, thankfully, it's an online, although, or not thankfully. It's actually not that thankful because normally an online interview, I'd be like, great, my apartment looks cool in the background, whatever. And right now I'm like, my apartment's in a state of disrepair, but I think I have another place I can uh, do my interview at. Tater Tot, I know you're so unhappy. You're stuck in your bag. Oh, my poor little me. And here, I'll show you guys. I'll take my uh, phone number down. Ooh, he's stuck in his bag. No phone number around, right? Ooh, my little man. Hold on, let me see. <laughs> Tater. Oh, my bag boy. Yeah, the camera's this way, buddy. The camera's this way. Tater. All right, back on the floor we go, little man. Back on the floor we go. I also had like a vet appointment this weekend. Kind of unrelated to anything. Yep, Tater's in prison. Portable cat prison. It's true. I'd like to think Tater Tot's always in prison, considering I trap him in my home and he has no choice about the matter. That's just uh, how I like to view things. Anyway, brave little baby he is. He is. Hello, hungry. Do you want to see the hole in my ceiling? I feel like you'll get a kick out of this. There's a giant hole in my ceiling. You seem like someone who loves holes. <laughs> uh Will it get fixed? Will I be able to live here again? Time will tell. Also, here's a very chaotic selfie I took. Don't jerk off to my feet. Um, after I cried and my ceiling collapsed. You can see all my furniture's everywhere. Stop showing my face. Focus on this. Uh, anyway. I was like, I can't live here. I'm homeless. Woo! Anyway, it's very alarming to have your ceiling collapsed. Sorry, I'm looking at more disgusting pictures to show you all here's a bunch of shit all over my floor eh, eh. and then uh yeah <sighs> it's also as frustrating no one came by to i'm just gonna complain about my ceiling no one came by to even like put down tarps keeping like can you do anything to like fucking protect things to prepare for the ceiling about to collapse and nothing fucking happened Nothing fucking happened. Nothing happened. Yeah, Tater went berserk. He decided to uh, shoot lasers at the ceiling. No, I had a leak that went awry. Anyway. Anyway, shall we talk about Sister Wendy Beckett, my favorite gal in the whole wide world? We can go on a little journey with Sister Wendy. There is a fucking bug. Is it a mosquito? I think it's a mosquito. I want to kill it. It's landing on my screen. Tater Tot, I'm sorry. You're in prison. And there's nothing I can do about it. Well, there is something I can do, but I'm not going to do it. Anyway, Sister Wendy Beckett. She died in 2018. Oh, a day after Christmas. Wow. Um, anyway, I wonder how. Oh, I just want to read about Sister Wendy. I also have to keep an eye on my phone a little bit for when I have to listen. I'm going to probably have to like end the call very quickly when someone knocks on my door. And I'm going to be like, they're here! My last apartment had a building, bu bulging ceiling under the tenant above his bathroom and it would leak tons. All I did was cock it on the tub. Oh my God. I, uh, I hate landlords. I hate them. Anyway, early life. Okay, she's born in South Africa. Oh, raised in Scotland. Fascinating. But she doesn't sound Scottish, right? Huh. Yes, because she, oh. What's? Oh, it's a nun thing. Noviate. Noviate. Period of training, preparation of the Christian novice. Na oh. Yeah, I know Tater. He's yelling at me. I don't know if y'all can hear it. Anyway. Wow. And then she went to Oxford. Wow. Sorry, I'm, I should read this aloud. Y'all can't see this. Um, She went to England where she completed her... Congregation of Religious Sisters Dedicated to Education. Cool. She was sent to England where she completed her Navi, Navitate, Navitate, and then studied at St. Anne's College, Oxford, where she was awarded a congratulatory first-class honors degree. What does congratulatory mean? Does that mean it's fake? Or is that just how the Brits call it? 
in English literature. Wow! J.R. Token was president of her final examinations board and asked her to stay on at the university. An invitation which she declined. Oh my god, I love Sister Wendy Beckett. Wendy Mary Beckett. So, oh god, my phone's buzzing. Oh, this, that's fine. Um, anyway, she returned to South Africa to teach, okay, okay, about English and Latin. Okay, so she's like South African. I mean, I know she's born there, but she like lived back over there. Returned to England, 1970, health problems. Oh, to go back to England, she obtained a papal permission, oh, from the Pope, uh, to leave her conjugation and become a consecrated virgin. What? The woman who has been consecrated by the church to live life of perpetual virginity. What the fuck? They call it that? And a hermit? So, like, is that, like, a church, per like, name a hermit? Begin living in a caravan? What the fuck? On the grounds of a Carmelite monastery at Heidenham, Norfolk, Norfolk? How do you call it in Virginia? And her caravan was later replaced by a mobile home. Besides having received the Carmelite Prioress, what the fuck does this mean? All this religious shit. I don't understand it. Um, and a nun who bought, brought her provisions. What? Okay, she dedicated her life to solitude and prayer, but allotted two hours of work per day to earn her living. Fascinating. So she was like, legit virgin. We know this now. I wouldn't have asked, but it's on her Wikipedia page. Can you imagine having it on your Wikipedia page like, hey, I'm a fucking virgin. And like, everybody's gonna know. Like, don't put that on my Wikipedia page. People don't need to know. Be like, it's not known whether or not she's a virgin, source needed. You know? Okay, a consecrated virgin is a woman who has been consecrated, am I saying that word right? By the church to a life of perpetual virginity as a bride of Christ. This is psychotic. I'm sorry, but this is psychotic. This is wild. Like, what a weird fucking thing to do. Uh, Diocesan Bishop? Okay. Penitence of Mercy. It is insane that their whole thing is like, hey, I won't fuck, I promise. Look, I swear it. I won't fuck. That is wild. That is wild. Yeah, she's a confirmed virgin. Tater really wants out of this bag. Little buddy, I know, you're so unhappy. I know, but but you do not want to roam around this apartment. Okay. <sighs> anyway, that is wild, right? Right? The hermit bit is also odd. This is why she went around calling people ugly. <laughs> yes. I think she's pretty open about her non-sexuality. I mean, apparently, it's on her Wikipedia page. This is like a normal thing for nuns. But they're just like, hey, I want to be like officially a virgin. I want there to be no doubts. Let me go up to the Pope and be like, hey, man, I haven't fucked. You want me to prove it? I can't because I haven't fucked. Um, that is insane. It's wild. 5,000 consecrated virgins living in the world as of 2018. Huh. In view of growing interest in the vocation, who is interested in this? And of the upcoming 50th anniversary of its formal institution, Congregation for the Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostic Life issued an instruction. What the fuck? Okay, Latin, July 2018. Oh, is there a list of the confirmed virgins? I feel like this would be here where it was. Spiritual gifts. Okay, they spend their time, works of penitence and mercy, in apostolic activity, I don't think I said that right, and in prayer, according to their state of life and spiritual gifts. Um, so what's Wendy's spiritual gift? Seems like she was a very good scholar, but I don't know if that counts. A consecrated virgin may live either as a nun in some of the monastic orders in the world under the authority of her bishop. It is wild that she was allowed to be a hermit. I don't know how it works with nuns and monks and whatnot. You think they have virgin conventions to all get together and not have sex? I hope so. Especially considering conventions are like the place where everybody is having sex all the time. Ooh, here's a Wikipedia page we're clicking on. What do we got? What do we got? Oh my god, there is. Okay. Boom. Wendy Beckett, she's here! God, that's that hurts. Hater, you're yelling, buddy. I know, you got so much to say. 
I also love that all of these people are like old, old, old. And then we got like, Wendy, what's up, y'all? I'm a virgin. I'm sure it's like a great honor to be, oh, she was. Huh. So she was a virgin. Okay. It's fun to out these people as virgins. Yep, you didn't have sex. You never touched a hole. Nope, nothing for you. Man. Wow, this is in your name, Margaret the Virgin. God. I feel like, yeah, it's like your bullies won. That's now how everybody knows you. Wow, St. Marcelina. This is freaking wild. Freaking wild. The nun in Pentiment was a hermit. Yeah, that's true. That is very true, which is fascinating. <laughs> uh, I find it so fascinating. I got, okay. I'm going back on the virgin thing. Or the hermit thing? I don't remember what I was talking Oh! Like, as a nun, I'm thinking back to this, one of those, like, ex like chef shows where it's like, we're gonna follow this, like, chef around. They're a master chef. And, like, have a, like, episode documentary about it. I forget the show that it's called. There was one about, I think she was Korean, a Korean monk who, presumably a virgin, was also, like, a really good cook in the, the monkery. I don't know what they call it. Um, but she also would like go into town and like teach people how to cook and have like cooking classes. And it made me be like, oh, I guess you can like still kind of live your life as a nun. Monastery. Thank you. Like, like as a nun, can you just like choose what you're going to do anyway? Monkatorium. <laughs> Monkery. Yeah. 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 Add Tater to the list of consecrated virgin. Thank you. Tater is a virgin. Tater, if you're a virgin, go meow. You just went meow. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, but. Tater, if you don't ever want to have sex, go meow. Oh, sh oh, there it is. Took him a minute, though. What's a CCD class? Is that th how to lose your virginity or, like, get it back, I mean? Virgin Martyrs? Let's check that out. Agatha of Sicily. Oh, my God! I'm going to get banned from Twitch for this. Can you see that? What the fuck? I don't think she's a virgin. I'm sorry, but I think after that... Okay, Belina. Dorothy of Casseray. Wow. So, like, if you're too good of a virgin, they'll kill you? Like, she refuses to have sex. Kill her! Oh, Tate, are you crying so hard? Ah, CCD, Sunday School for Catholics. Nice, nice. I'm so hungry. I should have eaten before this. And yet, anyway, um, Tater Tot, my poor little boy. Ah, what else should we learn about Sister Wendy? I feel like we had stuff. Feel set enough has... Okay, thank you, Wendy. Do you want to watch this? Shall we watch this? Her Odyssey into Art Criticism until, uh... It's time for the old repair people to be here. Let's do it. What do we got? How's the volume level? I don't know what this is. It's her sister Wendy's art odyssey. This has art been criticism. my home for over twenty years. Ooh, are we gonna see the caravan? My caravan may not look much, cool. but it is my haven, where I can be alone with God. And one of the ways for me of looking at God is by looking at art. This is so cool. We can see your caravan. Now live? I spend several hours every day looking at art and writing about it. Yeah, that's cool. What a life. All great art deals with human emotions and takes us deep into somebody else's world so we can learn more about ourselves. Art of Gospels documentary better. Thank you, we'll look into it. Leaving later. my life of solitude, even for a short time, is a very big thing. But I haven't had the opportunity to see many paintings in the flesh, so I'm going on an odyssey to see some of the greatest art in various cities around Britain. I hope to share with you the impact that they have when I meet them face to face. Man, she really, that's so fascinating. They let her just live in the woods. That's crazy. Also, they're supposed to get here in six minutes, so we might have to cut this short. But we will go back to this if we do. I'm beginning my it's odyssey in Liverpool. <laughs> I can't help thinking this is a wise choice. 
The city is so full of oh, galleries and museums that I can't really go wrong. But there's one place I can't miss, and that's the Walker Art Gallery. This is Sister Wendy's Odyssey Art Criticism on a YouTube. Nice butts. Wendy, don't look. You'll lose your virginity. The Walker has many treasures, but I've come today to see one great marvel in particular. Hmm, two, really. Perhaps three. Oh, shit. She's so, like, whimsical in this documentary. I must I confess it. that I have a passion for Pusan. And I wondered if I could Did share you? it. Because I will never have a better opportunity than with this very great painting. It's one of the great love stories of antiquity. How Phocion, the Athenian <laughs> general, was unjustly oh. condemned to death. And worse than death, because they burnt him and scattered his ashes which meant in their mythology that his spirit would never rest. And his wife came secretly, scooped up the ashes. Here you can see her. Put them in a bowl, put in water, and swallowed them so that he would have a tomb. She would be his tomb, his living tomb. Notice how afraid her companion is. Terrified they're going to be caught and punished, as, of course, they might well be. And the whole picture displays to us the great might of authority. All these great stately buildings, so splendid, so strong, so upright, so perpendicular, I so full of to... masculine power. The rule of law, which doesn't take much account of the human heart. And the world goes on unchanged and unheeding. It's a splendid portrayal, a moving, poignant portrayal of the eternal conflict between the individual and the state, between the human heart seeking what is right and the great authoritarian powers of the government imposing law. Cool. I would be very, I but would love Pusan to. Pusan can be called a great icon of true love. There's another picture that I want to see that shows just its opposite. The sad Ooh. inadequacy of lust. Ooh. He's like, yeah, if you're horny, I hate ya. Can't relate at all. This is the most haunting depiction I know of the story of Salome and John the Baptist. You remember Salome, the dancing girl? No. Who wanted his head on a plate? No. Well, Guercino is the only artist Pick who has tried to show yeah. why she wanted that head on the plate. And here you can see why. She longs for him, she loves him, or at least desires him, and he rejects her utterly. It's a haunting picture of one person yearning and another person saying, no. I don't think it's a very saintly attitude, but clearly he feels happy in it because he sees her as temptation, the other that he has to reject. And then you have the strange wonder of who really is in prison here. Is it John, manacled, naked except for his cloak, shut up in a cell? Looks like Tater right now. Or is it the wealthy princess Salome That's with me. all her jewels and her freedoms? I'm trapped in my wealth, shut Tater. In I'm not allowed to love you. Her own desire. And I will kill you. Look at the hands, his hands so free, so relaxed, so at peace her so clenched, so tight. And look at the witty way in which Guercino has made us wonder who really was beheaded here, because it looks here as if Salome's beheaded. She's lost her head, is what he's trying to tell her, lost her head in a desire for what she cannot cool have. Interpretation of painting so that's what the picture is about. Where is freedom? Does self-will imprison us far more Many stone walls and bars could ever do. Cool! Yeah, Wendy! Get existential! Contemporary artists also can show us profound and moving images. They're different from the Ooh. old masters, of course, a lovely and statue. challenge us in a different way. The okay, Walker have an impressive David Hockney. Whoa, Peter that getting out cool. of Nick's pool. A very personal title, and that actually is the reason why this is one of his oh, important shit. pictures. 
Hockney's always good when he's dealing with things that matter to him. Like but Peter and Nick were two of his closest friends. Hmm. Were they friends, In fact, Wendy? He's dealing here with the three things he loves best. What? That's water just gently what moving. Cheek right cheek. The sunlight pouring over the simplicities of a Californian landscape. And a beautiful young man. And what's very interesting about Hockney is that he suddenly discovered when he was still a student that art only works if it comes from love. It was no good him deciding, say, for the highest political motives that he'd paint dole cues in Bradford in the rain. It just wouldn't work for him. What worked for him was painting beautiful young men in sunlight, full of joy. This is a beautiful painting, but just the pan I up. I must to confess, the butt, really. I'm not oh. myself a great fan of Hockney's. It's not all that easy to say why, because clearly this is a splendid work. I think perhaps I find it a little bit too diagrammatic. Perhaps I feel he's got the world too intellectually ordered here for me to wholly respond to it as the real world. But I don't want to end on a on a minor note, because this really is a major Hockney, and I get great pleasure out of it. Like, I like butts too. Wish I could touch one. Among Liverpool's many galleries is the Tate of the North. They have a fascinating Stanley Spencer. Oh, I like she's looking at so many more modern And this modern will stuff. give me a very good opportunity to take a long, hard look at his work and try and make up my mind about it. Wow, look at that little cape twirl. Ooh, all the ding ding. Well, this is a fair example of a strong Spencer. Now, I too think it's a strong Spencer. In fact, I can leave out. Oop, Min Mac shows raising. Strong picture. As we start to see a naked lady. Watching more Sister Wendy. This Look at is the wonderful wall. Her paper. Odyssey into Art Criticism, it's called. Those lovely curl cues on, on the bed. She hasn't called the anyone ugly sheets. yet, but she is a confirmed virgin. I love so. his hair, too, all the, the glistening strands. You're very proud of his hair, was Stanley Spencer. And her hair, the, he's a bit uh, unconvincing about her head hair, but her pubic hair is lovely and fluffy. Oh, okay, Wendy. And he's painted the body so differently, too. He's these two weird contrasts. This sort of uh, corpse-like lividity below, and those sort of hectic flushes meant to show emotional excitement, I presume, above. The, the woman is Patricia Priest, the upper-class girl who tantalized him and, and taunted him all of which he, he lapped up uh, somehow, and for whom he finally divorced his wife, his dearly loved Hilda, whom he went on loving to the end of his days and writing to every day. They had one night together, Patricia having insisted that he make over the deeds of the house to her, and then a goodbye Stanley and welcome back live-in girlfriend. He's not spread out for his delectation. Patricia's completely indifferent to him. Of course, in, in, to some extent, that was the attraction. I must admit, I find her very unappealing, and you wonder where the elegance was, perhaps in the hip bone. Here's quite an interesting instance, actually, of an artist painting what subliminally he knows well, but which intellectually he does not know. At some level, Virgin Stanley too. knows they can never be mates. His art understands, he doesn't understand. But having said all that, and expressed admiration for many of the qualities here, especially that wallpaper, which I really think is lovely, I'm left feeling unsatisfied and yet I can't think why I should be I quite like this painting I'm glad that y'all came in on a horny moment but anyway she is a confirmed virgin I just want to remind everybody of that again 
She is 100% virgin. It is ordained by God. Untouched virgin. Confirmed. Confirmed virgin. There's still a lot left. I don't know if it's just like short little series. But confirmed virgin. Confirmed virgin. I've lived alone here for over 20 years, and art has become an important way of enriching my life of prayer. Okay, so now this I'm going on a journey life of Claire. to see for the first time. She's also some a hermit. We get to see her cool little caravan. I hope to share the experience with you when I see them face to face. She really lived out her life exactly as she wanted to, as far as I can tell, and I think that's incredible. She got to study art, practice art, and then just like live in the woods alone and read about art all day. I think that's awesome. Stop this saying confirmed version of getting flashed in college story. Never! And of course it has a special poignancy for me, because I was a student here many years ago. Yeah, I want to see pictures of her as When a I was a young nun... Wendy, no! You have so much to live for! ...mother who said, one must go straight out and straight back and oh, not Jada. break the rule of silence. So I had a strange magical Oxford, talking to practically nobody, seeing nothing, what? keeping the glamour intact. Ah, oh, how often I've walked down this street and never once gone into the Ashmolean. Wow. Walking into a museum is one of the most exciting experiences that life has to offer. That teenage me, or that me at 19, blissfully happy, had not much spare room for art. I laugh at it now. Hmm. Rich bad at games says the she's secretly lonely. Isn't everyone secretly is a lonely? Very I feel small like you're either secretly lonely or secretly like of such poignancy there are too many people around me I wish I could be alone. Blending. You know? When did you for Kirchen, thank you for painting the that. Thank you. Who painted it. They say here, Fra Filippo Lippi, which is our equivalent of oh, the Reverend Filippo Lippi. Some pictures almost seem to be Slices from a biography. And this meeting of two aged lovers who are finally going to have a child fits in almost uncannily with Filippo Lippi's own life. He was left an orphan on the streets of Florence and the monks took him in, which meant that just automatically, in those days, he became a monk. But he never wanted to be a monk. He was a man who badly needed human love. Mm. And he had a rather tempestuous and um, technically disedifying career as a monk. I don't think anybody minded because they knew he couldn't help it, really. And it was not till he was 50. He was too horny to be a that monk. He finally found a woman that he genuinely loved. Unfortunately, she was a nun, but she'd been put <laughs> into a convent too. So they ran off together and got a dispensation. So you can see how Joachim and Anna, these two aged lovers, who never felt their love was going to be fruitful. Well, I'm jealous you watched in class. Had a special significance for Filippo, because he too must have thought he would never have a child, never have a wife. After all, the life of virginity or celibacy only works if you want it. And then it works wonderfully, I can tell you. But he didn't want it. Good. Good and for so you, of Wendy. He was right. Enjoy your to virginity. For his partner. The birds have got partners and the beasts have got partners. Well, but so you see, I don't get it. Comes coming out of a very blank, empty Not her space. being a virgin, individual wanting to be a virgin. But going, going and being like, I want everyone to know I'm a virgin. Out of his I want the Pope to call me a virgin in my face. This is what I like. And from that will come the child. I'm glad she's confirming the virginity on stream. Now, Lippy was a man who clearly needed the support I love her of a loving so human cute. partner. Whereas Piero di Cosimo was an obsessor who only needed art. This is his painting of a forest fire. 
I'm not kink shaming her virginity. I'm kink shaming the Catholic Church for having a title a for like, you want to be a virgin? Here. Come to us and we'll confirm it. That's what I think is weird. If you want to be a virgin? Feeling, that's fine. But Go for he it. Lived only but on why? Oh, all day, so I feel no fellow feeling whatever. What? He would cook forty at a time and store what? them so as to waste no psychic why energy. Why does he want? What? To look after himself and feed himself. Fucking egg free. I have a great deal of sympathy. And he used his psychic energy. Yeah, I know, Tater ate 40 eggs. To share with us psychic these energy. obsessive visions he had. He took a these, turn on this one. These dreamings and wonderings Tater. about what life was like. Why are you yelling? Way back in the past. In the he is showing us a time so far back in, in the mists of human prehistory that the distinction between what was human and what was animal hadn't really been worked out yet, or at least that was how Piero thought of it. Well, I must confess that I animal. have a problem with this picture. Oh, no, they were... Not because of the picture. I think it's one of those magical pictures ever painted. The, the problem is, is me. I really can't find the words to tell you how magical it is. And I can only just say, look at it. Because some pictures you can come in kind of thumping and banging on the drum and say it's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. But others you have the sort of feather into speaking to you. It's so extraordinary. It is such an uncanny vision of a world that never was there, but exists so poetically to this one sole human man. It's almost like you have to eat 40 and eggs to really understand And trying to tell us something it. that he can't express himself. I'm going to put Tater on my lap. And I'm afraid I just have to say I, I can't do more than point to it. Is this nice for you, Tater? Good. My bag boy. I do like this painting. It reminds me of, like, shit from, like, kids' books. But, like, those weird ones, it's like, this art's a little freaky. And it's like, uh-huh. 40 eggs equals Constipation City. Or farts it. Nature for Cosimo is mystery, but for Claude, the great Claude, it's a severe arena in which human beings are challenged to rise to their spiritual height. Majestic. And this is a small and beautiful Claude, so tender. And here we have the great mythological scene, but I really can't afford to spend time looking at them because I want to get onto this huge Claude, this wonder of the museum. Hmm. With its strange and haunting story of how Arcadia was lost. Ascanius shoots the stag of Sylvia, which in itself mightn't mean much, but if you know the story, it means a great deal. But what's behind all this is a complicated historical legend of how the Trojans were welcomed into Italy and Ascanius betrayed the hospitality that they were offered. He shot the sacred stag. And if you look, you can see here this strange confrontation in which Animal looks at man, and man looks back at animal. He only has to open his eyes to see that's a sacred stag. It has the sacred garland round its neck, but he doesn't look. I don't think she... Oh, I can't, can't believe it. The I don't think she will talk about it, but I went to the cloisters, and they have all these tapestries. They're so famous, and you see them, and you're like, it's just a unicorn. And then you go there in person, you're like... Wait a minute, this is a bunch of tapestries of them, like, capturing and killing a unicorn. And you're like, why do medieval people fucking hate unicorns? Wendy, tell me why. Have y'all seen this one? Like, why do they hate unicorns? I don't understand. Watching World anyway, Conflict. This is what this reminds once me he of. shoots that stag, war will break out. He's selfishly intent upon doing what he loves doing, which is destroy. And, of course, which of us can say, not me? It's, it's an evening that you went with that me. Blue sunset color. We have the great temple which is destroyed. There's a suggestion to us of what will come. The trees 
leaning forward, mourning, grieving what man's going to do. We've got these empty boats. We've got the people fleeing. And yet, you see, nothing really has happened yet. It's just poised on that moment when Ascanius still can choose. Will he shoot the arrow or not? And what gives this extra poignancy is that this was the very last picture Claude ever painted. It's his last legacy to us that there is an Arcadia, there is a world of peace and sunlight. Don't you imagine when all dead and they'll be like, this well, is the last fart joke she ever and told. And still, it was really wet and but gross. If we want to, we, we didn't like destroy it. it. Glad she's dead. And that's what Ascanius is just about to do. That's a very beautiful painting. Oh, it's over. God. There's still like a billion episodes left. We're like halfway through. And don't worry. The repair people aren't here yet. It's a nice good four hour window of when they can come. <sighs> Coming to the fixers, people are gonna repair my ceiling? I don't know. They'll never be here, maybe. I'll be trapped forever. I'm so hungry, Tater. I've lived alone here so for hungry. 20 years, and art has become an important way of enriching my life of prayer. Now I'm going on a journey to see for the first time some of the greatest <sighs> works of art in Britain. I hope to share the experience with you when I see them face to face. <laughs> We'll be there between 1 p.m. and Friday. Is that work for you? Exactly! <sighs> Let's gaze upon the face of God. Thank Odysseys you, Happy are Year all Must. about homecoming. I and in a very real sense, family. that's what coming to Edinburgh is to me. A homecoming, because I was a child here. Thank it was you. here that my mother walked with me in the gardens. I knew even then that I wanted to be a nun. The British. What I didn't know was how I was going to love art and long to share. She knew already she wanted to be a nun. She's like, yep, I don't want to lose It's my very first visit to the National Gallery of Scotland, but I feel I know many of the works like old friends from books and postcards. But even so, it's hard to believe <sighs> the sheer quantity and the sheer wow. quality of the masterpieces wow. here. Wow. Three Raphaels, five Titians, and almost a wall of El Greco. I got Titian colored hair. Ooh, ooh. That's what I used to say because that's what Nancy Drew would say. And I was like, it's pretentious. No one knows what I'm talking and of about. So he is. But it is kind of fun. But it's what colors my hair? A Titian. Ooh. I feel we're being pressured towards admiration, as it were, and I get a little restive. The El Greco that I really love is the secular El Greco. Whoa, the that's one of cool. The very greatest examples, fabula or legend. Wendy, you know what? I'll and pick them. Books em. have been written upon books trying to decide what is the theme of this. Is that a monkey? You can see that it's sort of hauntingly beautiful, but what's it about? Well, I'm going to give you my stab at interpretation remembering that your stab is just as good as mine, but this is how I see it. Here in the center we have youth, the young man, and he's blowing on the embers. Now this act of lighting a candle onto a torch obviously has an erotic symbolism. <laughs> and I think we are meant to think perhaps of youth encountering the whole wonderful world of sexual adventure. But Ooh. it's a dangerous world. And on one side, we have this man inanely laughing. He's lost his wits. He's, a, he's not a full, responsible adult. I know, Taylor. And I think he's meant to be a symbol of one way of misusing passion. Here we have this mysterious figure of the ape, the monkey. And again, there are countless interpretations given to him. What comes most clearly to me as the meaning of the ape is that the monkey is so unpredictable. It's animality out of oh, our control. God. You never know Brian, what a monkey will do. When it bring Tater for the bachelor week. Either you don't mature or you can't get tater. control. And it all looms out of the darkness. 
and it's all saying this is something vital and virgins rise up human being thank you but Alice perhaps I limit it by virgins trying to give indeed. it one meaning keep it open at many meanings and you enter into the wonder of Earl Greco all right sorry I missed a lot of that one but I'm glad to hear yep Militarized virginity. Earl exactly. Greco was a clever and sophisticated virgin. It's nice to have one virgin and one non-virgin on the Nothing gives stream, me right greater here. pleasure than the bright, pure images of the late medieval artists. Peter. Many of whom <laughs> remain practically unknown. What are you doing, buddy? Hey. Hey, I'm gonna put you back down. Gerard David was a quiet, traditional painter. No avant-garde for him. And you can see how he's delighting in this old legend of St. Nicholas, St. Claus, better known to us as Santa Claus. Ooh. The first it's like, story I believe in God that's and always Santa's shown real. about St. Nicholas Santa, was also that the minute he was born. Look at that fucking baby. What the hell? Him, that's Santa? He stood up in the bath and thanked God for the gift of life. Oh, my God. He then that's informed fucked. his mother. That if your baby does that, burn it. On Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. That baby's, an act of oh, notification. hell, baby. You can see the rather baffled, astonishment. If your baby the does that, face. you know it's going to give gifts to children for the rest of the the eternity. Once a year. I, that's fucked. I didn't know that this was Santa's origin story. I hate it. missed out on Santa Claus. I hate it. may not have missed out on the three golden balls that show a pawnbroker's shop. Well, they also come from the Nicholas. Tater, if you're going to scratch, I'm going to put you he down. He discovered that a worthy okay, nobleman was go. impoverished. And alas, three daughters. He couldn't provide diaries for any of them. Notice they can't even have a bed each. They were the three girls like sardines. St. Nicholas is creeping up in the night and he's going to throw into the window three golden balls, which the poor, anguished nobleman can then give to his daughters and marry them off. What? And the third picture, also well known, after St. Nicholas had become bishop. His bishop of Myra. Dude, I don't like Santa. A this guy's and a fucked. famine raging in the town. Yeah. He then discovers, still worse, that children are mysteriously Dude, vanishing. Cool. And he suspects that a certain villain is cutting them up and pickling them. What? And this is going to be a support in time of famine. So what? So Nicholas in full canonicals goes into the room. He starts the pickling process the on these three kids. Labeled, and out spring three little boys, completely untouched and ready to come back to life again. Fuck. Now, it all sounds just sort of childlike and enjoyable. But what? I don't think so, Wendy. They're pickling kids. Santa has a baby see, stood up and thanked God for life. I don't like that at all. Children to your people. From the minute you start, you're you. And this one really says, do good by stealth. Don't parade in holding your golden Fair balls. So Sneak into people's houses and give them gifts. And this one, of course, is all about the fact that you can never be irretrievably destroyed. Cut up and pickled as brine and about to be put on the table as a nice dish of pork, you can still come back to life and be yourself again. So no disaster is final. And that's the, the depth with the charm and this radiant color and these gloriously expressive faces that what makes the Gerard with David the of the a kids? great painter, although on another level, he's a small painter, which is great to me. Dude, Santa Claus is fucked. That both makes me like Santa more and way less. That it's is just cursed. It's an astonishing thing how a great artist can seem to be overlooked by history. Now, Alan Ramsay, the great nice. Scottish artist, hasn't been forgotten, really but he's like never had his full well, recognition. Wendy, no! You have so much to live for! The National Portrait Gallery has an exhibition which really helps us to see that he's amongst the greatest British artists oh, of the 18th is. century. That's what a dark makes joke. Ramsey such a great portrait really painter me every time. I hope is not only is his work visually beautiful, but it has a sort of reticent strength, perhaps a very Scottish quality, that gives one a sense of a real person there. There's a psychological insight, but it's never obtrusive. He had lost his first wife, Anne. They only had about four years together, and the three children she bore him all died. But none of that She's is in this portrait. It's a wonderful affirmation of a strong, alert, intelligent woman. She looks at us with such a kind of happy cheekiness in her gaze. You feel she can give as good as she got, that one. And although okay. 
he clearly loves her, it's painted with, with very great attention to her personality. I don't feel here that sort of sensitive tenderness. This one is a partner. Margaret, the second one, is a wife. Okay. Interesting. Here is his masterpiece. His wife. Margaret Lindsay. We still like four my wife together. jokes? That's like eternal, right? And her parents never forgave her, but it was a very happy marriage. Now, people can differ as to what the expression on her face is. Some have called it serene. And she had every right to be serene. She was a very loved woman. Others have seen a sort of tenseness, a kind of gentle apprehension here. She had nothing, in fact, to be apprehensive about because they had a long, happy life together. But her husband had something to be apprehensive about. The flowers, you see, are not just there to make it seem a domestic scene. I'm doing the flowers, I turn around to look at my husband. They are, I think, expressive of something he had come to realize, that those we love will actually die one day. Mm. We can't hold on to them. And the poignancy of this picture, its sense of fragility, of a loved thing there, but not there for always, came to him relatively later, after his tragedy, but then he kept it in all his works. And perhaps no portrait painter of his time gave the sense of the self and it's not really being wholly at home in this beautiful material world, despite all the delight he gives us. All right, see you next time, Wendy. Enjoy being a virgin. I'm gonna bring Tater Tot to the Pope so you can be like, yeah, he's a virgin, but he wanted to be. He wanted to be a virgin. It was my choice. Uh, do you think For over they'll ever come and years, fix my I've lived a life of solitude and prayer. Now, for the first time in my life, I'm going to Europe. Cool. Wait, what? Girl, the UK is Europe. I mean, not anymore, but back then. Wow, this is so epically shot. Why is it shot like tour, this? In search of some of the finest art treasures in the world. Do cats get nine virginities? <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry, Everybody buddy. knows the splendors of Venice. But it's extraordinary to realize how somehow. so much human glory could be built upon mud and yet still survive for over a thousand years. Oh, New York is not a year. Yeah. The Venetians have a proud history, and the gondolas are a reminder of the city's long love affair with the sea. But she's never been to Europe. Like, if you live in the UK, think you can take a train there anywhere. And going to work what? every day, inspired by some of the most exotic in architecture in the world. But Peter, please stop scratching up the bag, buddy. The splendor of Venice oh, is man. only rivaled by the wealth of its treasures. So Doges and merchants were collectors on a prolific scale, and they decorated their buildings with works by the city's own artists, Titian, Tintoretto, and Veronese, and that's to name but a few. Mm. But I want to begin with a little-known artist called Carpeccio. His painting of St. George and the Dragon has been here for over 500 years. 500 years. St. George is one of those figures who's existed from prehistoric times. Our earliest legends speak about the hero who destroys the dragon of winter and the hero who destroys the dragon of death. And in some form, there's always been a St. George. We've always needed this knight in armor who comes out to defeat the evil. And he's riding out with enormous strength on a great black horse to defeat the dragon. Now, Capaccio has given us a oh, wonderful. Let me get a haircut. I'm bringing in a picture of this guy. With his great kind of pie full of energetic skin. Pie full? And his ferocious teeth. And we can what see this saying? dragon's been at work for some time because look at all the bodies strewn around. Jesus Christ. And notice they're not just young females. St. Like George may be the male who rescues the princess, but he's rescuing everybody, really. I don't think he's rescuing anybody. They're dead. Too. 
And what St. George is showing us with such power is the long, straight lance going right, right through. Look how it's gone in the mouth and come out the other side. And perhaps we ought to just look at the people right in the distance, standing there so safely on their balustrades and outside their fortress, uninterested, looking on when St. George alone battles with the dragon. Now your tater yelling. Now what the dragon is can be read in many ways. I think myself it's the dragon of our human pride, our own cruelty, the dragon within. I do love some good dragon art where it's like, the there were consequences, we a, people a died. A will and a determination, a sharp and as seriously wielded as St. George's, the dragon won't be slain. Peter, please our stop dragon, yelling. Our responsibility. Dragon D's nuts. That's so good. Thank you. Venice is a timeless city. It has a strange atmospheric light that has attracted artists for centuries. Their greatest works are preserved at the Academia. Here one can enter the world of the Renaissance when the city was at the peak of its glory. But this gallery can boast a jewel so crazy. precious that it rivals the Mona Lisa itself. Giorgione's Tempest is a haunting mystery and it's so delicate that we can't get too close. Did she talk about it in her other series? It seems familiar. Giorgione died in his early 30s. Yet he brought something completely new into art, a kind of wild, sweet, grave poetry, a, a sort of visual music that's never been equaled. And I think part of the magic has always been that nobody knows why they're enthralled by it. What is the subject? There have been endless explanations. A very early one was that here we have a landscape with a soldier and a gypsy. Now that doesn't explain the fascination of the picture. So then other scholars have said, aha, it's Mars and Venus. And others have said, no, 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 it's Adam and Eve. And others have said, gracious, that's ridiculous. It's the active life, the man with his stick, and the contemplative life, which is perhaps true, because if she tried to move all her clothes Please give fall, Tater a head rub for me. Not an Thanks. Active woman. I'm a party. I'll do and others, looking at that strange Thanks, gulf that separates the two, and said perhaps it's male and female, forever yearning towards one another, but forever apart. Okay, you can sit on the left. Here. But for what it's worth, I've got my own explanation, and it's this. I think the center of the picture is the lightning flash. But oh, we've got shit. a darkened cool. world. We see nothing. And suddenly lightning flashes, and we do see. And what do we see? We see two isolated incidents of which we can make no sense whatever. And then the darkness closes down again. So the painting is really all about that sense of seeing and not seeing, never understanding what you see that we all know so painfully well. Cool. That gives like that this picture its wonderful poetry. Giorgio died tragically young. But his contemporary Titian lived to a great age. Very few artists painting. get better and better as they get older, but Titian was one of them. Really? I would think that this more artists would get his better. Last painting. How practice works. Me? When Titian painted this, the plague was raging in Venice. So the fear of death was very prevalent, and it was very much part of Titian's own life. He was old. And he was afraid. And he's chosen for this very last picture, his sort of testimony to the world, the image of Christ dead being taken to the tomb. And next to him, so silent, so contained, is, is his mother. And then the two other figures. One is Mary Magdalene, wild with grief. He's painted her with the most enormous passion. She's angry about death. She's expressing something that Titian himself must have felt. That death is something we're not meant for. It's hateful. And on the other side, the old man. What we have here, clearly, is a self-portrait. Hmm. Here is the old Titian. 
yearning with such intensity towards his god. He was a materialistic artistician, made a lot of money and lived very well. Nice. We know nothing much about his inner life, but here at the end, he's telling us what matters to him. And you'll notice also how touchingly he shows himself, not just on his knees, but almost on hands and knees like a child, begging that his family and himself would be spared from the plague. And then to make it more explicit, he's painted a tiny little square there at the bottom. And there are himself and his son Horatio, both pleading with a heavenly figure to be spared from the plague. And by the time this picture hung in the chapel, both of them had died from the plague. Oh, God. So it's a wonderful affirmation that of God faith care. and hope that doesn't seem to be answered, but is answered in the very beauty of what he's portrayed. I don't know if he would agree with you on this one, Wendy, but go off, sister. For a second, I was like, can you imagine how horrifying it would be to live through a plague? Oh my god, I can't relate at all! Alright, looks like we have one more left. Oh yeah, Tater? Isn't it funny that cats can get COVID? <clears throat> he's so heavy. We just went to the vet and then they picked him up and they were like, Oh, he's heavy. And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> Wendy's like, prayers unheard, all dead. This is great. Yes. Paris is the city of lovers. And I wondered how I'd fit into things here. As a there virgin. There's no need to worry. Even a nun comes to life in Paris. Oh, nice, Wendy. It's a city of monuments and memory. Peter's boxed up because my apartment is unsafe to wander around Yeah, the business of art is taken seriously. After all, the avant-garde is a French phrase. The avant-garde is a French phrase. I'm beginning my tour at one of the world's most extravagant railway stations. Or rather, a but former Rhino. railway station. It's now the Musée d'Orsay. A fitting home cool. for French masterpieces of the 19th century. Wow, that's cool. There. There's a whole gallery here devoted to one of my favorite artists, Paul Cezanne. Much of his work is an observation of the everyday world around him. He was a difficult and neurotic man, but a genius who was unrecognized for most of his life. He was always harking back to romantic memories of his youth, reliving those few moments of happiness. Mm, more butts, I see. He was a very prudish man, very frightened of the flesh. And he would never have dreamt of asking any models to take off their clothes and stand in the woods for him. So how did he paint this? Well, he painted it in two ways. He painted it from photographs of bathers, and he painted it Maybe. perhaps from his memories. Okay. And he painted this obsessively all his life. This is one of the big things for him. And I think why this one is so so exciting and so successful there are like ten is because in it. he blocks us out of the picture. You see these two men in the middle? They're shutting us out. And this one has this um, towel that shuts us out still more. We can't get into those bathers. And of course, Suzanne couldn't get in either. This was youth. It was past. He couldn't get back. And he's buried the bathers in nature almost like a kind of lozenge shut in on either mm -hmm. side and notice how the clouds seem to follow the contours of the bathers they go up and down according to the heads behind the glorious color and the radiance and the freedom is a core of anxiety what Suzanne knew he couldn't have that that youthful freedom of the only time he'd been completely happy when, as a boy, he went bathing with his friends. And he's like, that's enough butts for me. I've sucked on this lozenge long enough. Off to the next Paris one. has always welcomed the modern, especially modern what art. So I'm delighted to have the chance to go to the Pompidou and see an exhibition celebrating the work of the great Henri Matisse. Ooh. Pompidou. 
Matisse was an intensely private man. Pajamis. And one of the great Cozy. interests of this conversation is that it's taking place between Matisse in his pajamas mm -hmm. and Madame Matisse in her dressing gown. And as you can see, it's a picture of marital alienation. Mm. What he's clearly showing is the, the dominance of the husband. The woman is not only low down, but she's imprisoned in that chair. She's shut in as if she was in a kind of black bag, actually. Matisse originally was more generous with her skirt. He's steadily diminished her and shut her up. And her eyes are just blots of darkness. She was a very strong, supportive wife, Adele, and she really didn't get her fair dues from Matisse. Poor put upon Madame Matisse actually was a very tough lady and a great heroine of the French resistance. I feel like she's most clearly um, trying to confront him with an aggressive probably tense Probably underappreciated, I would imagine. But one can't have feelings not going to get her anywhere. He, you see, is a great um, long streak of power. And look at that great thick neck that keeps the same straight line all the way with the pajama stripes that's a repeating big old neck. I don't like people whose neck is wise their head. Pocket. It's not right. It's a tense hand, you feel. He doesn't need to make actions. His whole body is speaking for him. He's the judge. She's the culprit. Hmm. And then a last very witty touch. The railings. The railings spell out N-O-N, non. And which one is saying no to which we really can decide for ourselves. But it's a marital no. They are not getting on. Mm. And the marriage did, in fact, end in an amicable divorce. They lived apart for most of their life. And we have to take a step back and delight in the pure, bright colours, the great radiant forms, to, as it were, set against this indication that a conversation between husband and wife may turn out to be each saying to one another, no. Damn. I feel like I go to therapy. Just talk to your spouses, tell them how you really feel in a non-judgmental way. Try no to work grand together. Your would be team. complete without a visit to the Louvre. This is one of the world's greatest museums, and it's not meant for the faint-hearted. It's a truly daunting task to tackle so many miles like of gallery Met. under one roof. You'll never but see the all the Mets. are unsurpassed. Oh shit! Everybody the knows the enigmatic smile of the Mona Lisa, we but less famous is the haunting face of an unmasked actor, Watto Gillet, what? the well-meaning fool, also known as Piero. Now, what's actually happening here is rather mysterious. It's certainly not a scene from any play. The actors behind, the four actors, plus the donkey, the most intelligent of the lot by the look <laughs> of him, they're doing something constructive. They're involved in some action. But here, alienated from them, all alone, stands Piero. Now, he's wearing Piero's costume. This silly costume with the unusable sleeves that have to be kind of rolled up even to get his hands showing. And the pathetic attempt to make his feet look pretty with those big pink ribbons. It's a silly costume made to look funny. But he's not acting. And he is not being protected by the cover under which an actor keeps his own self private. Because he's got no words and he's got no actions. Look at his face. That's not an actor's face. It's a young, intelligent, brave face, I think. Standing there like St. Sebastian to be shot at. Or a slave being sold at the market. And I think we all feel a sort of stir of empathy here. Yeah. If we're to be We should all have more at, sympathy for clowns. We want to be looked you know, at as Some say ourselves. that the streamer is the modern day jester. And, and perhaps it adds well. to the strange pathos what I hear, you know. to know that Watto died soon after painting this. And the man for whom we think it was painted, See a fellow virgin an actor friend of his, who always took the part of Piero or Ogilvy, 
also died. They were two sick young men, friends, who perhaps knew because they had tuberculosis that they hadn't much longer to live. And this commemorates what life is. Life is a vulnerable thing in which you may be looked at. Damn, Wendy. Damn, that hurts. Oh shit, is that it? That's it! All right, Tina, you're going back on the floor. Oh, you're heavy. Oh, boy. Oh. Anyway, he's already yelling again. Oh, I gotta order food, and I gotta... Fingies cross that they're gonna come and fix the giant hole in my ceiling. I'll show you once again. Because we all love holes here. If you love holes in chat, go holes! Holes! Let's see you say holes. Don't look at how my nails are. Holes. Taters yelling holes. <laughs> uh, I wish y'all could hear him go holes. Wow. Holes. Anyway, they may never fix my home. <sighs> In any case, thank you all for being here. Thank you for liking and subscribing. And supporting yowls holes. Um, I oh, thank you so much. Holes. Well said. Well said. I won't be back tomorrow because I am going to be busy. Twitch. Sorry, I had to find the link. Um, I'll be busy doing another kind of stream or maybe a recording. A little unclear. I think it's a stream. Um, and then on Wednesday. I will also be busy. And then Thursday's a maybe. Friday's also a maybe. Hopefully I'll see you then. Hopefully my house will be fixed. No promises. You know how it goes. Um, let's raid Fiona. I'll see you all over there. Thank you, as usual. Hope there's no underscore, let's see. Yes, anyway, thank you as usual to the mods. We appreciate our mods out here, thank you. Also, for everybody for hanging out and for liking and subscribing and supporting. It really means a lot and I appreciate it. Um, and I will see you later this week. I'll keep you posted in the Discord about more info. Goodbye, everyone.